Well, hello, friends. That's for Kevin here, and uh, I am recovering. I'm not right where I want to be, but I'm getting there. Hey, for the fa past few weeks, <clears throat> I've shared with you a clip from uh, the movie, uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas. You know, this movie came out in 1965. It's just been a great movie. Uh, something very enjoyable. And uh, in through this movie, we get the real meaning of Christmas when Linus quotes the scripture. But the beauty and the power of when Linus quotes the scripture is when he drops his blanket, uh, showing that we do not need to fear, that he could leave his securities behind and be able to move on. <clears throat> and we also learn that maybe what we really need is love. Well, Charlie Brown in the movie goes to see Lucy at her psychiatry booth, and uh, uh, the price of a nickel. Uh, good grief, Charlie Brown, you get what you pay for. Uh, Charlie Brown is uh, complaining about being depressed at Christmas time. And Charlie Brown, I get what you're saying. Uh, Bing Crosby may not be right. It's the most wonderful time of the year. In the season of Advent, we, uh, we are to light the candle of joy today. Candles announce the coming of the Christ child. But this child has been born and he has been crucified for our sins. He was buried and he is, uh, has done what no one else could do. He has risen again and he is going to be coming again. So our focus uh, at Christmas needs to be on that second coming. Nowhere in scripture did Jesus call us to remember his birth, but we are to remember his death and walk in obedience to what God's word says. During my uh, unintended sabbatical with COVID, I uh, was sitting with the Father and asking about the message for today and uh, the, the message of this candle of, of, of joy. And the Father said to me, the world's response to Christmas is busyness. It is to be a slowdown, a pause, shilah, pause and ponder, Sabbath, worship, Mary ponder, joy, rejoice in me, not about me. Do not be anxious. I created peace, not chaos. It is in me that you will find peace and rest. I think that's a very powerful message from God the Father. I want us to look at the beginning today at uh, Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 16. And we read, so they hurried off, that's the, uh, the shepherds, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which, uh, <clears throat> which were just as they had been told. Now, personally, I don't know what your Christmas tradition is. But for both my family and my wife's family, it has always been that on Christmas Day, we read the Christmas story from the Bible before we open gifts and do anything else. Uh, it may be the passage from Luke 2. It may be the passage from Matthew 1 and 2. But we're going to read the passage. And when I read this, this, this passage, there are a few words that really stand out to me. And one of the things that really stands out here is that Mary pondered these things in her heart. In other words, she thought it over. She was instructed uh, to fear not from the time that she found out she was going to have the child. Uh, she hadn't been married yet. Uh, there's a lot of lot to ponder. Uh, how will others see her? What will her parents think of her? Will Joseph be the man God had called him to be? I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they talked a lot about these things over the past nine months and on the journey to Bethlehem. But here she is, young, has a baby in her arms, strangers dropping by a place that, well, it was workable conditions, but not exactly where she had dreamed to have a baby. She was probably wishing her mother could have been there or her cousin could have been there with her. We don't really know. And as we approach this day and we approach this candle of joy, I ponder. I ponder what is joy. Is joy an emotion? And we only have it when circumstances are right. Um, when good things happen, we have joy. And when we don't, we don't. If joy is an emotion, then it should be able to be controlled and not control us. 
Joy is something good for us. And most importantly, it is something that can be produced in us. Just as we produce fruit when uh, there is none, and that fruit is nourished by our physical body, the Holy Spirit can produce joy in our hearts that can nourish our soul. Even in the darkest circumstances, the world, the Word of God shows us <clears throat> the simple truth that the enemy would never want us to know. If you have a flower bed in front of your house and you planted corn seeds in there, in a period of time, corn would begin to grow in that flower bed. Kind of strange, but yeah, you could do that. If you planted green beans <laughs> before long, you would have green beans. If you planted sweet potato vines, you would have sweet potato vines and possibly even some sweet potatoes at the bottom of that. But you're planting in a flower bed. And if you want flowers, you're going to have to plant flowers. You're going to have to work the soil to get rid of the weeds that come along and try to choke out the flowers. You want What you plant is what you're going to grow. And if you don't plant anything, you're going to get, you're not going to get anything. Weeds uh, are going to grow naturally, but it's what you have planted. And God is the creator. And he did not place joy out of our reach uh, or make it, make its presence in our lives dependent on our circumstances. Instead, he uh, benevolently created the nature of joy as well as love, patience, goodness, and other fruits of the Spirit so, so that we could have a, this product of our relationship with Him. That's why we, we can see people living in the most amazing seasons of their lives and still lack joy, while others experience the driest, most painful seasons and somehow remain joyful. The latter have learned how to grow their fruit in their lives through the help of the Holy Spirit. They don't wait for their circumstances to change, telling themselves that they're going to be happier when they get to what they were waiting for, and, and joy is unobtainable. They have learned to cultivate joy and, therefore, enjoy the sweetness during every season of their lives. Joy, like any other fruit, requires intentional choices. In order to reap, we have to make a conscious decision to do so. And just as the farmer works all year long to ensure the health of his land and then carefully, diligently sows his seed, we too must ensure that we have healthy hearts that allow God to make something grow in them. The, the fruit of joy <coughs> will never grow in a heart full of bitterness and malice. Neither can it thrive where there is a lack of forgiveness and unwillingness to let the past go. If Advent is about having hope and peace and love and joy, it isn't going to happen automatically. These are things that must um, we must chase after. As we chase after the Father and we find intimacy with God the Father. The seed doesn't die on the surface of the soil. It has to be planted deep in the darkness of the soil for it to burst forth into the plant that it was created to be. If you want to experience joy, not just at Christmas time, but every day, because every day is like Christmas, it's a gift. Uh, then there's something God's word simply says to do. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God clearly doesn't want us to be anxious. Jesus gives eight reasons why not to be anxious in Matthew chapter 6, 25-33. And I think the reason Paul and Jesus and so many other writers care so much about helping us get beyond worry and uh, being anxious is that it makes God look bad when we worry all the time. It makes it look like he isn't going to help us or he is out of control or he is not wise or he is not kind or he doesn't know enough to help us. Worry reflects, the, uh, reflects badly on our Father God. We have a Father who meets all of our needs. So opposite 
<clears throat> Paul commends in peace. Peace that passes all understanding. And he calls it the peace of God, and he probably means of God. Because Jesus said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. This is the very peace the Father and the Son have with each other. And the Holy Spirit gives us. And the pathway, the verse says, is the peace that is to let your request be made known to God. God is our central request. And I need you above all things. And, and, and we are to do it with thanksgiving. And thanksgiving directs us back and, and we give thanks for the things that have already happened that God did especially for us in Jesus. <clears throat> I say especially uh, in Jesus because it is in the way, in the text where it says, well, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This peace is happening because with Thanksgiving, we are looking back to Jesus and he did it for us. We are trusting in him. So we also are united with him and our Father in heaven who meets all of our needs. And therefore, we have a peace that no ordinary human understands or can produce. I believe it is God's desire for us to move our eyes and our hearts and our minds off the busyness of the season. So what can we do? What busyness do you need to cut back or out of your life? social media, games, the news. What, what what can you do to exchange time with those things for time with him? I ask that you continue to pray for me as I recover and experience the healing of God. I look forward to being back with you as soon as possible. Thank you. <laughs>